Welcome to the Health Trip Podcast. My name is Jill Foos. I'm a functional medicine and integrative nutrition health coach. I created this podcast to bring you along as we travel down intriguing science-packed roads, debunking old medical paradigms and perusing new innovative therapies and modalities with the finest functional medicine doctors, practitioners, and like-minded biohackers while living our best life. Enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode on the Health Trip Podcast. What if there is a way to map out your longevity blueprint? Longevity refers to how long you can live in a healthy state void of chronic disease. The four big horsemen of chronic disease are Alzheimer's, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease risk, and cancer. If you could take the guesswork out and know what your body needed in order to thrive so you could live your most optimal life for as long as possible, would you be up for it? Most people are complacent when it comes to their lifespan or the length of the years that they live, regardless of their health. I'm more interested in my health span or the length of years I'm able to live in my healthiest state. As we age, our mitochondria inside our cells begin to weaken in strength and numbers. Remember, mitochondria are the powerhouses of our cells and use the nutrients you bring in through your diet and supplementation to produce ATP, our body's energy currency. When they are not working well, your body isn't working well. Our genes also have a lot to do with longevity. You're born with your deck of genes, but it's how you live your life or the epigenetics that influence how your genes are expressed. There are simple and complex things you can do to discover your longevity blueprint. Mitochondrial health and genetics are just two components. I've invited a special guest today to talk about longevity and how you can start the process, the process to map yours out. Dr. Savage is the founder and CEO of MD Lifespan and has been a leader in longevity medicine since the late 1990s. Over the last 25 years of his medical career, he has focused on anti-aging and longevity therapies. He has built over 50 clinics across the United States and literally wrote the code for the industry standard software that's helped millions of patients. He has also developed a three-step process to build one's longevity blueprint, including detection, prevention, and intervention. And we're going to talk about those today. Dr. Savage has appeared in over 50 national publications, TV, news, and educational channels, and has been a moderator at national longevity medicine events. A medical disclaimer before we dive in. By listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice or for making any lifestyle changes to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any of my guests on my podcast. So sit back, open your minds, and let's dive in. Hi, Dr. Savage. Welcome to the Health Trip Podcast. So glad to have you here today. Thank you, Joe. I'm really, really happy to be here speaking with you today. Yeah, we are going to talk about a very exciting topic called longevity. But before we dive in, I want to know what has inspired you to become an integrative doctor specializing in longevity, coming from your traditional medical background. I graduated medical school at, from the University of Michigan Medical School, um, very high in my class, and I went on to become the nighttime ER trauma doc at the largest trauma center in the country. And I did that for 10 years. At the end of 10 years, I'm almost 300 pounds. I have heart disease, diabetes, thyroid issues, mm. insomnia, anxiety, depression. Um, I mean, you just go down the laundry list of all the different things. And I went to my physician and he, he wanted to put me on my seventh medicine. And I just looked at him. I said, Neil, there has to be a better way for me to do this. He goes, Paul, oh, you're a train wreck. You're the unhealthiest doc, or not, or not doctor. You're the unhealthiest person I have. He goes, you need to go get healthy. And I said, you know what? You're right. That's what I need to do. I had no idea how to do that. I remember walking out of the office down the sidewalk, halfway down the sidewalk. I suddenly stopped and went, I don't know how to do that. I don't know what I'm supposed to eat. I mean, am I supposed to eat just vegetables? And if what kind of meat is red meat really bad? And am I supposed to just eat fish? And when I do exercise, am I supposed to lift weights? Or am I supposed to, I need to lose weight? So I'm supposed to go running, right? I mean, the questions flooded into my brain and I didn't have a good answer to any of those. 
I sought out a very good nutritionist who put me on a very, well, I, I should say, initially I started eating myself. I was like, well, I'm going to have vegetables. So I was having vegetables. I was having meat, but I was also having a lot of potatoes and I was having pasta and rice because all the bodybuilders eat rice. And then I had a workout um, with, a, with a trainer and I was working out with him. And after six months, I got 13 pounds heavier of fat. Mm. And I was like, oh, by the way, I was drinking Diet Fanta thinking I'll lose weight drinking Diet Fanta. It was awful. And I was frustrated. Um, one of a bodybuilder came by and what he said to me was testosterone. That's all he said. And this was 1998. So this is back in the day where testosterone was illegal for doctors to prescribe for anybody other than a guy who had had his had had surgery. Um, I thought about it. I was like, oh, I'm not going to do that. That causes heart disease. That causes prostate issues. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, it's how I think that's that could be me because I had no libido. Matter of fact, my libido was so low that I hadn't even realized that I hadn't thought about sex for years. Wow. That's how low my libido was. And we did my testosterone level and it was that of a 90 year old man. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, I think I know what my problem is here. That's why I'm gaining weight. I have no muscle. I have no energy. I can't focus. I don't have sex drive. I don't have good erections. I went to my doctor who's a urologist and an endocrinologist also. And when I need testosterone, they're like, yeah, no, we don't do that for you guys. Mm. I was like, what do you mean you don't do that? He goes, it's dangerous. It causes prostate cancer and breast cancer and gives you heart disease. Um, and I walked away and I started researching it. And what I found out was that it, that wasn't true. It just simply isn't true. Testosterone didn't give you prostate cancer. That was based on a study done 60 years before, which only looked at three patients mm. to make that conclusion. So that just started me on this whole new exciting. And I was really quite excited at that point because I realized, you mean there's a lot of, out, a lot of stuff out here in medicine that I don't know. And I know, and I mean, and there's even more, I don't even know, I don't even know. So I started with nutrition and I went to nutritional conferences and got that into supplement conferences, that into hormone conferences. And within about a course of a year, I decided I was going to leave the emergency room and open up a practice here in Chicago that dealt with men and nutrition and hormones. And I did just that. One month into it, Suzanne Summer stops by my office, asked me to be a doctor in her books and told me very bluntly, if you want to take care of the guys, then you need to take care of their wives. They will bring mm -hmm. their patients. They will bring their husbands with you. And I that love is, that. That is the single greatest business advice I was ever given. Mm -hmm. And she's an incredibly wonderful woman. And she featured me in her books. Um, and that really has done my career an incredible amount of good. Because even early on, and I didn't know a lot about women and hormones, but I learned very quickly. Um, Every once in a while, angels uh, step into your life. And if you listen and you listen very carefully, yep. they'll change your life. And I'm sure your listeners out there see that in you as well. So oh. that's just kind of how the career all started. And mm -hmm. within about five years, I had 50 clinics nationwide. Um, and it was essentially health and wellness for men and for women. And it's been going ever since. What an incredible story. Did not know all of that about you, Dr. Savage. And I love that you put yourself through this program, right? Because right. that that makes you be able to be more empathetic towards your patients. Let me let me share this with your your listeners. I have absolutely I am the worst patient you could ever have. I was a doctor. I thought I knew everything. I knew nothing about health. I didn't eat well. I knew nothing about exercise. I did not exercise. I didn't, I didn't even know I was stressed. People are like, wow, you're the top ear doctor, the largest trauma center in the country. That must be very stressful. And I would look at him like, no, not really. Look at me. I'm, I can take it. Mm -hmm. um, but I also was an alcoholic. I was also mm -hmm. not sleeping. I was also smoking cigarettes because I was so anxious all the time. So there's not anything that any patient can ever tell me that I wasn't. Mm. So I just invite my patients all the time to, to understand I get it. I get it. I get where you're coming from and I get where you need to go. The thing that I want to hopefully impart with your clients and your listeners by the end of this talk is it's not that hard to do it. Everybody, what blocks people from doing this more office is the concept that this is a lot. This takes a lot. It takes minutes per day, period. 
right? It's just creating a new normal of healthy habits to replace the old bad habits. Correct. 100%. And that's the part that I tell people that come to see me all the time. It's like, there's a lot of things that may need to change, but you don't have to change them today. Pick one thing and let's work on that. And then we'll add something new in a couple of weeks. And just gradually, one step at a time, your life will right. shift. I don't know. I don't know, Joe, you can uh, disagree or we can have a little conversation about this. But people who come to see me who want to do it all at once, who try to do it all at once, are the ones that don't come back. Right, right. I would say by the time somebody gets to me, they've already been through eight to 10 different programs or seen an multiple nutritionists, doctors, fad diets, whatever it is. And it's just all been a big fail. So by the time they get to me, they're really in a vulnerable state and they're willing to go very slow and be methodical and build that healthy foundation. So I'm, um, I haven't really come up against anyone who hasn't been ready to do the work by the time they get to me. Yeah, I have that same thing. I mean, people come see me like, you're my last hope. You're right. you know, the last exactly. doctor that I have seen. I get that too. Yep. And I do share that these people are very vulnerable and I want, and they're very good clients and they've been my clients for 20 years now. Yep. But every once in a while, you get those patients through, they're like, let's do it all. And I know they haven't, I guess they need to suffer more. I'm not sure, but they try to bite off too much too soon and it's too much. Yes. You really, the point is, I try to make to every client is, Let's take a couple things and let's start mm-hmm. working on them. And it always starts with your nutrition. It always right, starts. Right, right, right. And people are so brainwashed by the marketing of all the commercials and what they tell them that they really think that they're doing well because that's what Dr. Commercial tells you. But yes. it's not. Right. I would agree. Well, this is a great segue into my first topic I wanted to discuss with you. Um there's the Harris poll in May of 2023 took a survey and found out that 70% of Americans are dissatisfied with the current healthcare system. I'm sure that is no surprise to you. Not at all. I'm just surprised that it's only 70%. Right. So why, what is going on with our healthcare system? Why is it continuing to fail us? And do you see it turning the corner to become more of a preventative healthcare approach versus a sickness healthcare approach? Great question. And I'm going to start by saying, how did we get here? After World War II, the government of the United States decided to use a healthcare system that was fractionated. And that's where specialists came into being. Whereas many countries in Europe decided to go with the primary point of contact with everybody having primary and you only refer to specialists. So part of the problem was we bifurcated um, the healthcare system. And what that did was just basically get a whole bunch of heart doctors that only look at the heart and nothing else. Got right. that, I mean, it just doesn't work. That's one of the major things. Then came insurance. And the insurance problem was that they only paid for it when you were sick. Mm-hmm. And then finally came pharma, which basically convinced everybody every answer is in a pill. And so that's where we are today. So do I see the fact that our healthcare uh, system can turn a corner, become preventative, become better? No, not in its current state. It, it cannot. It's on. Um, it's a totally different animal on a totally different trail. You're going to have to completely overhaul and change the way we do medicine in the United States if you want it to be more preventative care. I mean, and I should say very clearly that preventive care and You need both proactive and reactive care. I mean, you have to have both sides. We have only a reactive model now. And the reactive model does not work with a proactive model in the way, in the current way it sits within the insurance. Because insurance only pays for it when you're sick. It doesn't pay for it when you're well. Now, I know in Europe, there are some medical schools who are integrating uh, like nutrition courses and cooking classes and very progressive thinking about how food plays a role as medicine, not, mm-hmm. not here so much that I know about, but no. wouldn't that be great? Like you went to med school, you spent all this time, all this money learning about medicine. And here you are on this, this one day you decide you're going to have to change your life and you have no idea where to start. So right. the same goes for so many people out there. How can people better educate themselves and become better health advocates if they don't know where to start? Yes. Yes. Um, the place to start is the tenets of health. 
And there's five essential tenets, nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress management, and detoxification. Now that's, you and I both know, we've, we're taught a lot of that in nutritional courses, and we're taught a lot of that in integrated medicine courses. And I tell people all the time, if I can't get these five things working well for you, all the other stuff that they always come and talking about with the peptides and the hormones and the stem cells and all these different things, it doesn't work well unless right. you have this basic part down. So start, uh, my, my martial arts teacher, I've done martial arts for 20 years. My martial arts teacher always says, everybody's a white belt at some point. In mm, other words, everybody, get, you get to be a novice. Even as an adult, you get to walk into a class and say, I don't know anything. Humility is one of the best characteristics that you can have as a human, because even for yourself, you can go to someone and say, I need to learn. Mm -hmm. And that's what broke for me back when I first got into this is I finally broke through this part of I'm the top doc and the largest trauma center in the country. I know what I need to know. And that means I know a lot and I know everything. And I didn't know all this other stuff. And I didn't even realize I didn't know it. So when I became, when I became willing to change, when I became willing to say, teach me, show me. Um, and then later on, I was able to say, um, I want to prove it to myself. My life took a totally different traje trajectory and one that I absolutely recommend for everybody that I come in contact to. So how do people better educate themselves? Start with the basics. Um, read nutrition books on people who get good reviews. Uh, go see a good nutritionist like yourself, Joe, who people can respect because you've been in this long enough to know not only what the literature says, but you've been able to see what, what works. I also think exactly. people have a lot of intuition that they don't realize they have. Yes. Right. I have um, a client now and she's the first in four generations of obesity to stand up and say, I need to change my life. Right. And nobody around her, she had no mentors, she had no good role models for this, but something inside her said, I have got to do this. And she's, you know, a midlife woman has another third of her life left and she wants to have it look and feel different but something inside of her awoke it wasn't something she read she doesn't know any of this stuff she just knows she feels she has to be on a different path sort of like what you did for yourself exactly and yeah. we, we we all do know we yeah. have difficulty admitting it to ourselves yeah you know because that means hey if i admit this then i have to act upon that right and that right. but here's what i tell people you know you need to do this you know you're at a place where you can do this. Now what you need to be able to do is allow yourself to do this mm -hmm. and allow yourself to do it at the speed at which you feel best. Right. It's that part of safety that you give people to tell them it's not going to change overnight. I tell my clients all the time, depending on how far away from health they are, is it could take minimum, I tell people, the six months. Usually I tell them it could take up to two to three years. And that also is something people don't want to hear. Right. You know, I have to do this for two to three years. No, you have to do this for your lifetime. Exactly. But it starts, but it starts today. Right. Right. Rome wasn't built in a day. And yeah. I tell people, if you are coming to me for a quick fix, I am not the right health coach for you. Yeah. I tell people that all the time. It's like, mm -hmm. I have one prerequisite that a, a patient must have. They must be willing to change. If yes. you're not willing to change, if you're not willing to try something different, don't come to me. Right. That I will get frustrated and you will certainly be frustrated with me. Dr. Savage, what does longevity mean to you? Oh, um, longevity is, you know, the, the model, the mission of MD Lifespan, the company I own, is giving life more moments. That's mm -hmm. what longevity means to me. It's not about how long you live. It's about how well you live and being well enough to contribute and do whatever it is that you're supposed to do in your life. Health span breeds lifespan, but without health span, lifespan is nothing but suffering. I like how you put that, how it all connects. And when should people start thinking about longevity? <laughs> There's um, 
there are a lot of simple rules in medicine. One of the simplest rules is it's easier to keep what you got than get back what you've lost. Mm. So you're, it's never too early to start longevity. It's never start too early to start taking care of you, your heart, your, your spirit, your body. It's all connected and it requires, you have a requirement, you have a commitment to your body to help it be the best it can be so it can be there for you so that you can accomplish whatever your mission is in life. Even though I specialize in working with midlife women um, and men, I also work with a lot of 20-year-olds. And this is a very interesting topic of discussion to have with people in their 20s because they're really not thinking about longevity at that point. No. You know, they want to go out on the weekends. They're um, staying up too late. They're they're doing a lot of things and they get away with a lot of things for the most part because of their age. Correct. Uh, but what would you say to the 20 year olds listening to this podcast? Because there, I do have a small population of young people listening in terms of their longevity and, and how to approach it. I, I tell them, and I have a lot, I have 30 nieces and nephews, but even, even other people come up and that's a great question. The answer is you have to think of longevity the same way you have to think about retirement. Now, you can hmm. disregard both and not think about them for decades. And then you're going to find out by the time you're 40 or 50 that you should have been thinking about that when you're in 20. So there's very few things that I found in life that people regret. <clears throat> it's usually they regret the things they haven't done. And the things they haven't done, like taking care of their health and take care of their financial health mm -hmm. and starting it earlier. That's the biggest regret that people have. That's a great analogy. I love that. Yep. I love that. All right. Biohacking, big buzzword out there in <laughs> uh, the world of longevity. It's um, it's used in functional and integrative and holistic healthcare spaces. But when I think of biohacking, I think of the things that we can use that we already have within our reach, right? The choices Correct. we make about eating, how early we go to bed and, and et cetera. But biohacking in the real world can also refer to these very expensive therapies, modalities, and protocols that just seem like if we're going to talk about the 20 something year old and wanting them to really hone in on their longevity blueprint, um, they might not be in a position to afford all of these things. Right. So what does biohacking mean to you? Well, I think this all goes back to the same thing. I have clients that come in and we have procedures that are very effective here in the office that we do for people. Um, one of the more interesting ones is therapeutic plasma exchange, where we're actually exchanging your plasma for saline and albumin. And it's a, essentially it's giving your body an oil change, just like the most effective detox on stuff that we've never been able to detox. And that's relatively expensive. I mean, it can run from between $5,000 to $35,000. But even I have clients have come in and they call me up because I want that. I'm always shifting the conversation to where are we on the tenants? Where are right. you on your nutrition? Where are you on your exercise? Because if you come to get one of those really expensive procedures, stem cells, therapeutic plasma exchange, growth hormone, any of the hormones, you're really looking at a lot of money out of your pocket that if you don't have the tenants yep. well controlled, well managed, you're wasting your money on the other stuff. So what is biohacking? Biohacking is the colloquial um, buzzword for how do you affect your epigenome? You, everybody knows what their DNA is, and then your DNA opens and closes in certain spots, depending on what the cell is asking it to do. What should I do? The DNA is your book of life. It gives you all the rules. The cell looks at the DNA, and says, this is going on, and the DNA tells it how to react. But that's the whole point is the DNA isn't telling the cell what to do. The cell is asking the DNA what to do, and it's getting a response. And that response depends upon what the question is from the cell. If the cell's living in a clean, healthy, nice environment, and it says, I want to get bigger, the DNA says, do these things. If it lives in a toxic, acidic, um, low hormone environment, it goes to the cell and says, what do I do to get better? It gives it another set of instructions, which in the long run, isn't that good for the cell? But that's the answer it's getting because of the environment the cell is living in. 
That's the epigenome. It's the environment around the DNA that determines what the, what the genes do. I have people come to see me and they have incredible genes, but they make bad life choices and they're very, very sick. Even with good genes, you make yourself very, very sick. I have other people with really bad genes for Alzheimer's, heart disease, cancer, yet they are very conscientious of how, you're, how they take care of themselves and they are very healthy. So I tell people all the time, you're blessed if you're given good genes, but you're more blessed if you know how to manage them. Mm. Yeah, I say that a lot to my clients as well. I, I actually do genetic testing um, in my business model. As and you I, should. And as I should, love, as, ever, yeah. as everybody should, because you want to know what potential yeah. bad genes are there. So, you know, it just reinforces for people even more. Yeah. You have the lung cancer gene. You really should not be smoking because you've just increased your risk of lung cancer by a factor of 500%. I mean, right. there are things that I can show people. You have the Alzheimer gene. Let's go work on your immune system. Let's go work on your toxicities because we know that makes a difference. And it also gives people, okay, a little bit more respect of the things that could happen down the road. Because my goal as a longevity doctor isn't to make sure you don't get a disease. It's just to make sure that it doesn't happen early. Matter of fact, it happens as late as possible, if ever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I work with a lot of women with hair loss, and I myself have been on a 25 year uh, up and down roller coaster ride with hair thinning, hair, massive hair shedding, and hair loss. And I've turned it around. But before I went and did these expensive biohacking or alternative therapies that cost a lot of money, um, I made sure my lifestyle was right. I made Correct. sure I got in the optimal amount of protein I needed to support hair growth. And yes. I made sure I got in the right amount of my micro, um, uh, micronutrients, maybe through supplementation. And we all need some supplementation Not everybody needs some help there in terms of our mitochondrial health. I want to True. make sure that the message I was setting up to be sent in my cells was to grow more hair. Right. And so I had to create a healthier lifestyle for myself in order to plant the seeds to do that. And, and then if you want to go up these other levels and try these different modalities that are usually not covered by insurance, they're going to work for you better. Correct. You know, Jill, it doesn't matter what a patient comes to me for, for longevity. Right. I mean, they could have cancer, they could have a, a colitis, they could have inflammatory processes, they could have chronic fatigue with infections mm -hmm. and everything going on. The rule is still the same. Right. If you do these five things on nutrition, exercise, stress management, sleep, and detoxification, I don't care what you have, you will be better. Yep. Yeah. Period. So you utilize a three-step approach to help people set themselves up for optimal health and longevity. And I want to break down those three things with you and really get a good understanding because I think this approach is 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 amazing. And it's also a very easy approach to understand for people who are in the non-medical space. So the first one you talk about is detection. So tell us what detection is and what that involves. Detection is the ability for us to use current innovative technologies to see what's coming your way. Now, if you want to look at all the different top 10 reasons that Americans die, and you're looking at heart disease, number one, um, a CAT scan of your heart, or what's called a coronary calcium scale, can be done at most radiologic centers, and it's not covered by insurance, but it costs you $50 to $200. And mm -hmm. what that's going to do is give you a calcification score of the arteries around your heart, which is linearly correlated with how much heart disease you have going on. The difficulty that I had as an emergency room doctor back 30 years ago was watching these guys and women come in the room at 2 a.m. in the morning, sweating, diaphoretic, you know, sweating, uh, short of breath, gray, holding their chest. And I'd be sitting there going 20% of their heart gone, 30% of their heart gone, realizing why hadn't anybody thrown up the gauntlet years before to tell these people, you're going down the wrong path because when I'd interview these people as the emergency room doctor, they're like, I have heart disease. My doctor never told me I had heart disease. I have cholesterol problems, but 
there are ways that there are many tests out there. And unfortunately, a lot of them are not covered by insurance because insurance doesn't do prevention. Right. Calcium scores or uh, calcium scores, a CT scan of the heart is a very cost effective way to determine, is that something you need to put on your radar? Another test that is gaining a lot of a um, lot of notoriety or a lot of uh, press lately, which I'm very glad it is, is liquid biopsy. Liquid biopsy is the ability to look in your blood to see if you have cancer. Believe it or not, it's been the holy grail of prevention medicine is finding a blood test that tells you if you have cancer. We have that test now. We've had it for probably 15 years, at least it has been in Greece. I've incorporated it into my practice for more than eight years. How does that work? Uh, how does it work is that the, well, first off, you should start saying, whether you're a man or for a woman and you're doing the preventative screenings that's available to you through your insurance, which includes things like PSAs, colonoscopies, skin exams, mammograms, pap smears, and lung cat scans for those people who smoke out there. Stop smoking, for God's sakes, if you smoke. But for those right. that do, we do cat scan at heart. And if you do all those tests regularly, like you're supposed to with your mm -hmm. doctor, that only covers 30% of the cancers that kill you. 70% hmm. of the cancers are not looked for because we haven't had a cost-effective way to look for them until now. And is there, there's two essential liquid biopsy tests. How they work is you give your blood, it goes to the lab. The lab has the technology now to look in a sample of blood cells of, of, of blood. And they usually send off like nearly 60 cc's of blood. And they can tell down to one cancer cell per milliliter if it's present. So we can actually have a computer now that can detect these cancer cells, which are cells that come from the cancer itself that the cancer is putting into your bloodstream to hopefully put somewhere else, set up shop somewhere else in your body. So we can detect those. Or the other test looks for what they call cell-free DNA, which is they're looking for, not for cells, but they're looking for the DNA that matches cancer DNA that's free floating in your blood. That's how it works. If it's positive, you have cancer somewhere. Doesn't everybody have cancer cells in them? So everybody has cancer cells, but if the, if the immune system is doing well and your environment is well, you're not going to see them in your blood and you're not going to see the markers, which are the proteins on the covering of the cells mm. in the blood as well. So everybody has cancer that the immune system keeps under, uh, uh, under taps, it, it knocks it off, it keeps it down to a very, very low number. But when that cancer starts to grow a little bit and to the point where it starts to give those proteins in the blood and the cancer cells in the blood too, now it's starting to get outside the realm of just being what we call seeds of your own destruction or quiescent cancer. It's starting to wake up. Here's the point. When cancer first starts until you die, that's what we call the cancer cell life cycle. In most cancer cases, that time span is around 10 years or more. Yep. However, when the cancer first starts to grow and the difference between a normal cell and a cancer cell is very simple. Cancer cells have lost the ability to self-destruct. Normal cells have that ability. So when they reproduce and they reproduce and reproduce and people should understand every time the DNA reproduces, it's like a fax. It becomes a little less of what it was originally. And then a fax of a fax of a fax, of a fax, of a fax. Mm -hmm. And eventually that DNA is so broken, so abnormal that the cell initiates a self-destructive cycle. So it blows itself up before it turns to cancer. But in some cases that doesn't happen and the cancer cell develops, that's when the body, the immune system, the, endos uh, the, um, the endocrine system around uh, the cell starts taking the fact and it keeps that cancer cell asleep, what we call sciescent. But eventually when your immune system goes down and the toxicity goes up and these sciescent or zombie cells wake up and then they start dividing, now you have a cancer that's starting to become loose. That's when they start showing up in the blood. Hmm. Very so interesting. The, the interesting part about that is as they continue to grow, they grow and they grow and they grow until you're about halfway through the life cycle. So maybe five years. Now, finally, if you happen to take an x-ray, it shows up. But you don't have any symptoms because usually 
the life cycle of the cancer cells, your symptoms occur around 85% of the way through the life cycle. So mm -hmm. almost, I mean, towards the very end, you become symptomatic, which is why on the cancers we don't detect early, the ones that are not on the preventive screening, the first symptom that you have of the cancer is usually the, the terminal symptoms that it's stage four and you're going to die soon. So who is a good candidate for the liquid biopsy? I'm assuming it's people who have family history of cancer or maybe cancer, they've, they've had cancer themselves. And is that a tough discussion to have with that candidate? So everyone, in my opinion, ought to have that test done every year mm. because cancer is becoming more and more prevalent because of the toxic environment yep. that we live in. Yeah. When should you start having that? Well, I mean, that could be a really good question if you're costing, talking from a cost analysis part, probably 40 years old. But if you're talking about, I want to make sure my 20-year-old doesn't get cancer, I want to make sure my 15-year-old, my five-year-old, we can do these tests at any age on any child or any adolescent or any adult. So the real question is, who should get it done and when? That's a great question. Um, my answer is, it can be done on anybody. And anybody who has the $1,500, which is what that test costs to do, and I have patients do it every year, the hard discussion isn't getting the, getting the test, especially for the adults who are 40 and above, because cancer is the second leading cause of death. And it absolutely truism is the earlier catch cancer, the more avenues you have to get rid of it. Matter of fact, when it's so small that it doesn't even show up on an x-ray, it's usually pretty vulnerable to a lot of different things, including nutrition, mm -hmm. including supplements like quercetin and capsaicin yep. and green tea. So when should you get it done? Everybody. Should. Who should get it done? Everybody. When? When you decide that you're ready to start doing a proactive health care for yourself and looking to see if you have cancer developed. My experience in seven years of taking care of people who are healthy, who have a positive test is in general, I can tell you I've done this for eight years. None of my patients who had diagnosis of cancer have died because they've all found it early enough mm. that they found ways to mitigate those risks. Right. However, I'm like I'm like reporting what's normally reported as well is that's about 1.5% of the population every yeah. year. Yeah. So if I have 100 people do it, I'm going to have one or two of my patients turn positive that year. And then we need to go down the road further to see, is this an advanced cancer or is it in beginning stages which is what you have to do only in the beginning and once you know what you're what you're facing then you can implement nutritional programs medication programs or even consults to an oncologist when in when the need and arises because unless the cancer gets big enough for them to get a biopsy a piece of tissue they don't consider it cancer at them even though the tumor markers are there and the cells are inside your blood hmm. Very interesting science on that. I want to talk about APOE because that is a great test to take to find out if you are a carrier of the Alzheimer's gene, which I have had all five of our kids do. So mm -hmm. we all know I have a huge um, uh, chart of all of our blood work and our APOBs, our APOEs, like every we know our genetic markers, and I can see across the board, all of my kids have um, at least the four, except for right. maybe one. Yeah. Um, so talk about the APOE, because this is also in, um, this would fall under detection for Alzheimer's and dementia risk. Correct. It'd and be an early detection. It, well, all genetic testing is early detection. Right. Of um, course. Because I mean, hopefully it's early detection. Hopefully you've had your genetic testing done before the disease process has set in because if you do it beforehand and you know what you're looking for, there's ways to delay it at, or at worst. So ApoB or ApoE is one of the um, proteins that sits on top of uh, the lipoproteins that deliver the cholesterol around the body. And this one is specifically noted to have a couple different variants. Um, you have the 2-2, a 2-3, and you also have 3-3, and then 3-4s and 4-4s which is just how we do it, what's called alleles, because you always have mm -hmm. two genes. So you always right. get two numbers. And yes, it's very important, not only for Alzheimer's, so for heart disease. Right. And also for longevity, because the, the gene you don't want to have, and you have no choice, you're dealt by the 
hands of fate that your parents give you is the 4-4. The 4-4 puts you at significantly higher risk for Alzheimer's and heart disease. To, to be the point where there's also studies that suggest that the most advanced age you're going to get on a 4-4 is about 65 years of age, which is not true. But in people who don't take proactive measures against it, that is true. Very interesting. You know, it should be included on a comprehensive panel for everybody at least once. When it is mine. <laughs> yeah, but it, but it is but, included in my panel because I need to know right. what I'm looking at because again, I'm, I'm a mathematician before I became a doctor um, and a computer analyst. So I tell people all the time, it's a numbers game. And if I'm and if your family history says heart disease and Alzheimer's, there's things we need to do now. Right. But the point I was making is in the medical conventional medical healthcare model, the standard blood panels that most people listening to this podcast are getting are just not good enough anymore. They are not a good assessment or a tool to use to assessing your risk for these chronic diseases. I would say that's true of virtually every test that they do in your traditional doctor's office. No longer is a traditional cholesterol test right. sufficient. You right. need to have the particle sizes. You need to know the particle numbers. You need to know not only the CRP, but you need to know the other oxidative factors or inflammation factors like um, the sedimentation rate. You need to know the lipoprotein A. You need to know the oxidative rates such as monoperoxidase. There's just, it's just not sufficient. There is not a single test that somebody brings me from their traditional doctor that helps me formulate a plan yep. to keep them well. And it is so frustrating on my end because here I am as a health coach trying to help my clients become better health advocates for themselves. So on this particular topic, I have a very comprehensive lab list that I've developed and I coach my clients on the conversation. I have them listen to very high level podcasts on heart health, on the APOE gene, whatever it is that they need to listen to. We spend time doing that. I prep them for the conversation. They go into their piece, their primary care physician. They have the discussion. And at the end of the day, he must mark off 80% of the labs and say, you don't need this. You don't need this. Who are you working with? You don't need this. Yeah. This makes no sense. And I said, you know, that's not your doctor. Yeah. Hey, I, I, I give all my kudos and compliments to my brethren who are doctors in the traditional healthcare system. I cannot do it. Um, but it is, it, and um, most of my colleagues and friends who I know, most of them are to a great deal um, unhappy with what they're dealing with. Right. But um, we have to go forward with doing whatever we can do with what we're being given because they live in an insurance model and insurance right. only pays for certain tests. The reason that doctors don't do this test isn't that they don't want to do them. The reason is insurance doesn't pay for them. And in the traditional healthcare model, you have a contract with the insurance company that you will only order tests that they have approved of. But even if my client went in and said, I will pay cash for the ones that are outside of your model that I can't get covered, I'm willing to pay, they still won't order them. No, it, no they, it's not that they won't, it's they can't. The doctor in the contracted insurance model cannot order tests mm. outside the insurance model is in there. It's in most of the contracts. Mm. It's not that they don't want to. They're prohibitive. If they do, they put their contract at risk. And some doctors do. And I'm not yes, heard some do. That I'm not heard they get a lot of slack from the insurance company, but it's in the contract. So the doctor huh. isn't purposely not doing it. He's trying to maintain his livelihood of being a doctor to all of his patients by not having his contracts revoked. Got it. Very interesting. They're in a tight box. I know I was in that box for 10 years. Mm -hmm. There are certain things I could do. There are certain things I could not do. And if you try to do them, it caused trouble for the system or for you individually. One of yeah. them was going outside the system. It just, yeah. it, it, it is, the system is in place to work the way it does. Yeah. I don't agree with that system. That's why I left that system when I decided to do preventative health, prevent people like why don't you take insurance, Dr. Savage? Because insurance won't pay me. 
It's not that I won't take it. It's that they won't pay me. Dr. Savage, can I get all these tests done by my insurance? No. Why? Because insurance won't pay the lab for those tests. They've said, these are the tests we paid for, and that's not on the list. So it's nothing that we're coding wrong. It's nothing that we're not wanting to do it. It's very simple outside the rules of the contract. Very good to know, Dr. Savage. Let's move to your second part of your formula, which is prevention. Tell us about that. Prevention is the thing that you and I talk about every day. It's about what you're eating, how you're eating, how often you're eating. It's about exercise, which one you're doing, how long you're doing, how frequently you're doing it, how much sleep you're getting, how are you managing your stress? Because you and I both know you cannot affect your, you can't minimize your stress. You can't get, it's very difficult to get rid of your stress. The only thing you can do is learn how to manage it. Right. Which is, I think, the part that people spend too little time on. And then detoxification. It is incredible on how much respect I built as a doctor over 30 years in the integrative world and longevity to realize that in the end of it, it's the detoxification part that ends up being the weakest link that we have in the human body. So let's talk about detoxification for a second, because I bet there are people out there listening saying, oh, he must mean a juicing detox. Right. No. Right. Uh, the, the simplest answer I tell people all the time is detox starts daily. It's very simple. It's about what you eat and how much you eat and when you eat. If you don't eat foods that are covered in pesticides and herbicides, if you stay away from meats that aren't injected with antibiotics and steroids and chemicals, if you're making good choices every day about what you're putting into your body, that's the first step of detox. Mm. Is the first step of detox is don't become toxic. The yeah. other part that we talk about with detoxification, um, again, fasting is the easiest detox anybody can do. What you're really doing is allowing the systems in the body that detoxify you, the kidneys, the skin, the liver, to not process more food because it has to process the food and detoxify the remnants of the food before it can move on to all the other stuff because the main purpose of the digestion system is to get energy so we can do all these things. So detoxing the food is the first thing that the body has to do before it can do the viruses and the toxins. So if you're eating all the time, your detox system never has a chance to work on the other stuff. So simply taking 24 hours and drinking water and not eating, it allows an incredible amount of work on your detox system to do on the backlog of all the other stuff. Although I'd have to say women, I think, struggle with that more than men. I think fasting long-term for men is a lot easier, but women, especially if there's a thyroid condition going on. You're yeah, absolutely, absolutely correct. I was giving general, general statements. Yeah. It has to be individualized. Yeah. Yeah. Also people who are relatively chronically ill, they can't fast a long time right. either. So we right. have to take these, I'm talking about a young 30 year old man Got or it. a young 25 year old woman who doesn't have a lot of medical issues. Typically a 24 hour fast is not a problem, but that is the best way to purge the body of toxins is to simply give it a chance to work. Yeah. And, and you just, the, you just mentioned the word, sorry to interrupt you, you just mentioned the word methylation. And so this is one of the genes I look at is the MTHFR. Uh, me and five of my children are all homozygous for uh, either the 1298 or the C, the 677. Yeah. Um, most, no, actually we're all 677. And um it's very important to know this about yourself yes. because your body is always going to struggle with detoxification. That's what I was saying earlier is 30 years in this field of integrated medicine. I started with nutrition and hormones and exercise and sleep and stress and finally got around to, okay, let's look at the microbiome, which is what I should have looked at mm -hmm. first. And then looks at how your body detoxes, which should be what you look at second, because as we age, these processes break down. And if you have genetic, um, heterozygous or homozygous that are not in your favor and not just the MTHR, but right. the COMT and there's other detox pathway, yep. SOT, the, uh, the, they all have to be relatively strong in their effectiveness. If you don't, we have to start looking at ways to limit the, the, to limit the need to use those pathways or supplement those pathways in whichever way you can to bring that more up to normal. Now, many people with the MTHFR, you know, 50% heterozygous, they don't really suffer a lot. There's ways you can measure it. They are, they're handling it well, but there are people that don't do well 
And they, it could be that they're eating too many things that they have to methylate or they're on medications or drugs that they have to mm -hmm. methylate. And it, you have to look at the totality of it right. on what it is on the detox system, because here's a very, very important rule. You don't have to, ha all you have to do is have one of the pathways break down mm -hmm. and the whole system falls apart. Yep. And I tell people, this is never going to change. There's no switch to turn this around for you. It is going to be, lifestyle is going to be your first line of defense. And then Correct. you're going to have to supplement. And so um, that brings us to intervention. Yes. And by, and by the way, folks, if you're listening, Dr. Savage and I are going to do more podcasts and really dive deep into these three different processes we're talking about. So right now, today, you're getting just a general overview. So we're going to go into the third, which is intervention. And where do you want to start an intervention, Jill? Because <laughs> there's, I, I should tell patients all the time, or clients that are listening is that, if you're working with a nutritionist or a healthcare provider or a doctor and the doctor, the health nutritionist or the uh, coach is not listening to you, mm -hmm. then you have the wrong person. Right. The whole, what I tell people all the time is by the time you leave my office, we will have a plan in place. And if you are not 100% on board with this, we need to have more talk because there's a lot of different ways to do things. And I can do it within your beliefs, or I can actually influence your beliefs, because maybe I believe I should help educate you so that you overcome a fear or a, um, a something that happened to your mom or your dad. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you have to play in here. But at the end of the day, if you don't come up with a plan that works for you, it's not a plan at all. Well said. Let's talk about supplements in terms of intervention, because I think supplements are a huge component to someone's overall uh, health and wellness equation. And I feel that they are very mismanaged and abused. Um, there are a lot of proprietary blends out there with very cool hip packaging that yep. say they're going to promise you this and promise you that. Or maybe you take a supplement because you're on five different Facebook groups that are talking about longevity and diet. And, you know, three people said they're using this supplement and it really worked for them. So now you're going to go buy it. Or right. maybe you're at yoga or your gym and your friend is using it and she's had great success. And just talk about the, the pros and cons of this approach. Um, well, there's probably zero pros to this approach. Yeah, but, a, I agree. yeah, yeah. Listen, we were just talking about this before we started the podcast is, one of the issues I had when I was starting to get healthy is I only had the stuff that was in my head because they do not teach you about health and nutrition in medical school. Right, right. I only had what the television taught me. So I was thinking I had heart disease and Cheerio lowers cholesterol. So I started eating Cheerios and then I started drinking Diet Fanta because I, uh, I didn't want the sugar. And then I was eating vegetables like potatoes because it's a vegetable and I was getting sicker, but not knowing the whole time that... I didn't understand some of the very essence of here of nutrition. Now, it is without a doubt in my mind that the nutritional value of food has substantially decreased in yep. the last 40 years. Now, I've seen studies that said that, but I'll tell you what hit home with me. About five years ago, I was lucky enough to be traveling and we had a chance to stay quite a time in Brazil. Brazil has a system that's different than the United States. Instead of 45,000 things you cannot put in food, which is the United States, Brazil has 13 foods, 13 things you can put in food. And those yeah. are the only things you can put in food. So we had no chicken with steroids or antibiotics. We had no beef that wasn't you know, on the range and eating grass and hay. We had vegetables that were free of pesticides and herbicides because Brazil does not allow DuPont in their country. And I have never tasted food that flavorful in my entire life since I was like, I'm 60 now, but this is back in, when I lived on the farm when I was 10 or 12. That's where it really hit home is like, we've really messed with the food here in the United States in yeah. the food chain because the food we have here is very low quality. No longer is it about organic versus inorganic. It has simply to do with the low nutritional values of our food, period. Yep. So let's talk about supplements because that's one way. There's other ways to, you, you can search out pathways that have better food to be delivered to you. It's expensive, yep. but there's ways right. to do that. But let's talk about the other way, which is nutrition. Now, 
Your reader should understand I'm the first doctor to put together an electrical, uh, electronic medical record system for the field of integrative medicine. And we had over 6 million patients collect that we were collecting and looking at the data. And we looked at 45,000 supplements over the course of seven years. I am the one person that actually could tell you without a doubt, 95% of the supplements that you are that are for sale in the general market have no nutritional value. I don't care what their marketing plan says. However, there are a number of them that are very good. And people are ask, always asking me, what's my favorite vitamin or which is my favorite supplement? I always tell them it's not my favorite vitamin or supplement. It's my favorite vitamin or supplement company right. that you want to know. And you and I could have a whole through yep. discussion about the six top companies, which mm -hmm. in our research showed these guys were, or these guys and women were far, far, far ahead of everybody else. And those are where you should spend your dollar because spending money on a supplement that has no nutritional value is of no value. Yep. What are my top five supplements? Um, I'm a big fan of a good multivitamin, just for the fact that mm -hmm. food doesn't have a lot of the basic nutrients that we need. I'm a big fan of magnesium. Every American is low on magnesium period. Well, magnesium, let's talk about magnesium a second. There's different forms of magnesium. There are, there's a, I mean, it really depends on what you're, what you're trying to, trying to treat. Right. If, if there's um, magnesium three and eight, there's magnesium uh, tartar, tartarate, there's magnesium citrate. All of them have different medicinal uses. Right. All of them have magnesium. So if I'm trying to give somebody something for their gut, I may or may not go with a glycinate or a citrate, depending on what I'm trying to accomplish. If right. I'm trying to do something in their neurologic system where they have anxiety, I'm, I'm looking more for a three and eight. Um, so yeah, we can go yep. through all those. That's the whole hour discussion right. on itself because people hear all the time, this magnesium is good for you. The question isn't, is magnesium good for you? I'm telling you 100% of Americans need magnesium. It's which form of magnesium right. do you need to have? And I'm making the point because I want people to know that you must work with some type of healthcare professional so that you get exactly what you need. There are ways to test for that. Yep. There's very good nutritional testing out there. Now, here's something, your readers, we could have another fun discussion about this. When you go to the, your doctor, a traditional doctor, and he draws your blood, that's venous blood. That's the blood that's already coming back to the heart and the stomach to load up and get rid of all the trash because it's already dropped everything off at the cell. Venous blood is the corridor from the cell back to the body for getting rid of the garbage and pulling up new nutrition to be on board it. So that is already depleted of vitamins. So looking at venous blood for what your vitamins you need is ridiculous. It's like going to the garbage dump and saying, which food do I need to buy for the refrigerator? Mm -hmm. You cannot tell. Mm -hmm. You need a test which actually it looks at the cellular level of your mm -hmm. nutrition or what's called the indirectional functional level of your vitamin, because there's a thing that we're called biochemistry. Mm -hmm. It's where you take one substance, it becomes another substance because of an enzyme driving that reaction. That's the bio in the chemistry. And all that enzyme always requires supplements to make it work right. And the supplements are missing, that enzyme won't work right. And we know all these enzymes, we know all these products, we know all these substrates. So there are companies that look at that reaction rate and by looking at all the enzymes that need magnesium and they're all running slow, therefore functionally, we know you need magnesium. But for God's sakes, stop looking at your doctor's venous blood test and tell yourself right. that you're low on those vitamins. That's not helpful. Right. I use a um, the micronutrient test and there's a couple of really good ones out there on the market and I use there one are. and it's a blood draw and what the report comes back and it will show my clients if they are okay on a nutrient, borderline deficient or functionally deficient. And then we right. attack it from how are we going to correct these deficiencies? Because correcting the deficiencies corrects and supports the mitochondrial health. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, Joe. Oh, no, that's okay. I'm moving away. I'm on the radio. <laughs> sorry about that. No worries. So it's, they, it's came, just, they came and knocked on my door. And my dog, my dog, uh -huh. would let me know that everybody was here. My two are laying right outside the door. Is <laughs> <laughs> so it was good just, until they showed yeah, up. Yeah, it's just really important to test and not guess. So I want to swing back to you. Recommend a good multivitamin, a good magnesium, and what are some of the other ones? Quercetin. 
Mm, another, yep. We are so inflamed as a, as a, because of our diet, because of radiation, because of viruses. I mean, there's so much out there now. We are, we are so inflamed. Quercetin is one of the best anti-inflammatories that yep. you can have. It's anti-cancer, it's anti-inflammation, it's anti-heart, it's anti-Alzheimer's. It's a, it's a requirement that people, it's the vitamin that the people know the least about. Yeah. CoQ10. Yeah. Again, or whether it's CoQ10 or glutathione, you need a good antioxidant. That's different than an anti-inflammatory. That's something that helps put out the fire. I always tell people the difference between oxidation and inflammation is oxidation is the fire. Inflammation is the heat. And you need something to take care of the fire and you need something to take care of the heat. So CoQ10 is a good, good on that area or um, glutathione is another one that works amazingly well on the oxidative part of the body. And do, you, then finally, do you prefer for glutathione the shots or liposomal? What kind of delivery do you prefer? Well, so that, that's a great question. And the point, the point I would go back to is how deficient and how sick are they? Mm. So initially, if I have somebody who's very deficient, they're very oxidative, I will want to do the IV infusions of glutathione mm. because it's the best way of getting the glutathione levels up and getting the oxidation under control. Down the road, the liposomals work very well at the doses they can give, but you just can't do enough liposomal glutathione in yeah. the early stages of highly oxidized people to get that under control. Who's highly oxidized? Heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, they're all oxidative states. And you have to turn that oxidative off. And people, your body is an oxidative machine. We burn things. That's what the body burns fuel. We burn fat. We burn sugar. But that, that reaction has to be balanced so you're not burning too hot. And you have the antioxidants to take care of all the sparks that come off that fire. And what's the fifth one? Um, fish oil. Everybody yes. needs a good oil. I yep. mean, it's just the aconosoids. Uh, we just, I mean, I tell people all the time, water is not a good lubricant. Oil is a good lubricant. And we are just a bunch of pulleys and dials, um, levers, and uh, you know, everything has to move in relationship to everything else. And we just, and even eating the fish, we don't have enough good fatty fish. The fish that we have is not really, it's not the good fat anymore, unfortunately. There's right. a lot of the bad fat in the in the salmons and stuff. So yep. getting a good nutrient, and we could go through the best fish oil companies because there's yep. half a dozen of them, but there's not, but it's not everybody. Right. So everybody stay tuned for the other podcast coming up with Dr. Savage because we're going to deep dive into all of these three the detection, the prevention, and the intervention. And when we, when we talk about pod, the um, supplements, we're going to dig a little deeper into dosing and what that looks like and forms because it's all important. So please do not listen to your neighbor on supplements. <laughs> I mean, you can listen to your neighbor on your supplement, but don't believe that's good for you. Exactly. Well, that's what I mean. It is, right. it is, a, it is a relatively complex qu question that you and yes. I have years of experience in answering. Yes. And more than that, we have thousands of patients of antidote of what we know works. Yes. I mean, here's the thing I tell people all the time. Why do you like that test? Because I know it works. How do you know it works? Because it matches you clinically. Why do you that supplement? Because I know it works. How do you know it works? Because it matches you clinically. I right. mean, we've had experience of it's worth the money and all this right. other, well, could I buy all this other stuff? Maybe, but why? Right. Right. And I'd like to also add in that the stage of life you're in also matters in terms of supplements, right? So 100%. Right. A 25 year old female who's on oral birth control is going to need something much different than me as a 55 year old menopausal woman. And Correct. so everybody's equation is very different. And you and I both focus on bio individuality. This is the same thing that you have with prescriptions. People mm -hmm. change over time. They don't need the same prescription or the same dosage of the prescription right. over time because the whole situation changes. And I get people, I'm sure you do too, they come in 50, 55, 60, and they're on 15 different supplements yes. and 14 different medicines. And the first thing I do is try to go down that list and try to ask them, why, how long have you been on this and why did you start? And mm -hmm. almost nine times out of 10, first thing I'm doing is taking half of them off and say, okay, I'll talk to you in a week. Just don't take those and let's see how you feel because right. they're, they're just, we're so ready to put new stuff into the system when in actuality, we probably need to take things out as yes. well. Because people are 
conditioned to want a quick fix. They've been in pain for so long, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain or mental pain, they just want the quick fix out. And this is a slow moving process and the most rewarding of all processes. Yes, correct. Yes. Well, Dr. Savage, we are coming to a close. Is there anything that you would like to add um, before we say goodbye on finding one's longevity blueprint? Very simply, listen to Jill's podcast. (laughs) I'm saying that for my own benefit as well as yours, but you and I have a ton of very good information to give to your listeners and they don't have to um, go research this to see that we're giving them good information. You can take this information as good facts and you can apply these to your health and wellness. As I mentioned, it it goes tons further when you have a knowledgeable person to guide you down that path. But there are so many things that you can do that are easy to do that you can start doing just a few minutes a day. As again, the thing that I want to get through to patients, your listener all the time, is that it doesn't take a huge commitment to design what you're going to go buy in the store the next day for your breakfast, lunch, dinner, or if you're like me, your one or two meals a day, it's simple. It just takes you a few minutes to make sure that you're going to go in, get what you need and get out before you buy stuff you don't want. Right. Right. doesn't have to be so overcomplicated. So I'm going to add in your website and all your social media handles on the show notes. Um, but do you have any free educational material on your website that people can access now? And I'll put a link in the show notes for that as well. I have a lot of free educational material, whether it comes to nutrition, supplements, therapeutic plasma change, hormones. We have a lot of different papers for people to download. Plus, I'm a big fan of YouTube. So if you go to the MD Lifespan YouTube channel, we talk about inflammation, oxidation, longevity, nutrition. Uh, I just put together a lot of very short, very simple uh, videos that people can really start understanding what they need to do. Great. I will add all of that. it's It's not hard to do it. It just, at some point, I hope you make a decision that you want to take control of what you do with your life and not leave it up to the fates. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Savage. Next up, we're going to talk about detection. We're going to do a deep dive on detection. I'm really looking forward to that conversation with you. And thank you to everyone for tuning in and listening to this episode. And until next time, see you then. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Lifestyle changes can be hard and overwhelming to make. By building your support team of functional medicine doctors, therapists, and health coaches, you can reach your optimal health goals. Be sure to check out my other podcasts. Until we meet again, stay healthy.